Your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. For we believe it is good to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. So let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For we believe that great is God's steadfast love toward us and that the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Our special selection is O Triune God, Holy Trinity, song by Ken Canino. Um, and then there's a choir from St. Francis de Sales Parish in Ajax, Ontario. the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may be led into your truth and taught your will for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our reading today is from Romans 5, 1 through 11. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope 
does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we still were sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we have been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from the wrath of God. But if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more surely, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life. But more than that, we even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. The word of the Lord. So we celebrate Trinity Sunday that sometimes we don't always understand what it's all about. There was a cartoon showing a lawyer reading his last will and testament of his client to a room full of greedy relatives. The caption reads, I, John Jones, being of sound mind and body, spent it all. <laughs> when Jesus wrote his will, he gave us all he had. Not only that, but he also died so it could be in effect. That's reflected in Hebrews 9.15 following. So we find our riches in all three persons of the Trinity. Trinity is something you could say is one that clergy are supposed to kind of dread when it comes to thinking about um, what to preach. Attempts to make it all simple with drawings or triangles can take us just so far. We can end up giving the impression that we're confused as anyone else. The glory of Trinity Sunday, though, isn't mathematical sleight of hand or unconvincing attempts to define God in any way, but that we should just stop and just wonder at God himself. On Sundays for the last six months of the year, we've been thinking about the great events of Jesus' coming into the world, but now it's time to take stock and to pause and to refocus our sights for God who was visible and yes, even measurable and understandable in Jesus Christ, also far beyond our definition. If the study of theology doesn't necessarily take us to the heart of God, and the first commandment is not that we should understand God, but that we should love God with all our being ourselves. This is what we are trying to do as we worship God each week. So our worship is like our financial giving, should be judged by a yardstick. Remember when Jesus saw a big, impressive gift, and then the widow's penny, he said that her gift came from the heart. If we measure worship by any other standard, like beauty or punctuality or liturgical correctness, or length or brevity, the kind of music we include, the amount of happy clapping or the lack of it, then we will be led astray. So these are not the ways to judge our worship of God. Worship is coming close to God our Father in love, and our participation of the love is the gold standard, you could say. Love that is drawn upon by our appreciation of God's love. Well, in the Romans reading, Paul is evidently being bowled over by God's love as well. The Good News Bible has no less than four exclamation parts in the few verses points. Romans isn't an easy reading translation either, but in this passage, Paul particularly sings of the joy of knowing God and the wonder of his grace. He writes as a man who has spent years of his life looking for something, but now he has gloriously found it, or in fact, it has gloriously found him. Many religions and much Christian tradition have been concerned with religious deeds, the things that we must do to satisfy God. 
Do this, obey that, and you will find peace with God. The passionate first four chapters of Romans describe how Paul has devoted himself quite strenuously, trying to do all the things necessary, but finally came to the conclusion that, try as he may, he'd fail. He said it was a dead end. Doing things for God, however, is beautiful, though. It will not bring us to the other side, or his side, because he is holy. We could say are twisted, and never to wait until meet on that basis. So then in chapter 4, Paul describes how God knew that all of this uh, was bound to fail, but has provided us a better way, and the only way which comes to terms with humans as they really are. Well, if your child, for example, did something you know perfectly well that they really can't do, you may find you have to let them have their go at it first, though, to reach that point of failure before they're willing to let you show them how it might need to be done. So God let them try their own way before he could teach them. Struggle as we may, we can never pull ourselves up to heaven by our own boots places, you could say. So God took the initiative himself. In his own great expanse, expanse, he did it for Paul, and for you and for me. For everyone who wants it, such grace is, of course, freely given. Even the faith to receive is not something which we have to squeeze out of ourselves, but it is really God's gift to us. Suddenly we wake up out of our sleep and see we have it right there in front of us. Peace with God. Trusting faith, which means the acceptance of God and His Word, has done what the heavy duty part of doing religious works could ever achieve, not as much. The relief is discovering this filled Paul's mind, and it never left him. The joy that filled his heart remained with him as the years went by. Whatever happened, what joy gave him the strength to that joy, cheerfully endure the many imprisonments, the beatings, the insults, even the sadness at times we see in even the churches he built up to lose their first love. Well, some people object that free grace sounds, you know, too easy, and that there ought to be some element of effort on our part before we deserve what God gives us. But our relationship with God depends on continuous good conduct on our side. The gospel would be the bad news. Even if it was a combination of him and us, it would still be bad news. Or we placed our faith in God's redeeming work on the cross, so it is his responsibility, not ours. If some days we are feeling a bit low, it's isn't that important, although we've obviously been much better and happier to continue trusting Him each day, of course. But if it relies solely on Him, it's good news. The wonder of God's grace to us, the goodness which we must stop at. Look, we look at this Sunday in the year now. Now that we have put, been put right with God, and that's through our faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He has brought us by faith into this experience of God's grace in which we now live. So we revel in the hope that we have of sharing in God's glory too. We also reveal in our troubles that because we know that trouble produces endurance and that brings God's approval and it creates hope. And this hope does not disappoint us. And for God has poured out his love into our hearts by means of the Holy Spirit, His Spirit, and that is God's gift to us. So let's have a closer look at God's whole series of gifts to us. The first is being put right with God, the bringing to an end of the uncomfortable relationship. If you owe someone some money, you really ought to have paid them back by now. You're unable to look at that person in the eye because you know you were in the wrong. But then, if the debt is somehow paid, you can shake hands, face that person once again. You're all squared, squared up. You have a dignity instead of embarrassment. 
You can talk with that person about other things, you don't have to avoid them anymore. And of course, that's on a very small scale example, compared to the damage done to our relationship with God by our sinfulness. In our day-to-day -day lives, we tend to become quite blasé about both sin and forgiveness. Our prayer life will be cramped if we're uh, lazy about acknowledging our need for forgiveness. It will be dependent on it as we take our sinfulness more seriously, you could say. And then we seek God's pardon more wholeheartedly. Well, the second gift, which flows from being put right with God, is having peace with God. So you no longer need to put up defenses or hide from him, kind of like Adam and Eve. A sense of trust can flourish as between two neighbors who get on well. They don't harbor suspicions about one another or assume the worst every time something unusual might happen. Peace with God means we can look more positively at the things which come to us in life, seeing them as opportunities rather than problems. Peace with God enables us to listen to his voice more attentively as we find less need to crowd our lives with other things, which is the way the rest of the world keeps God at arm's length. The third gift is being ushered in to receive God's grace. Christ has come to escort us into the palace. We could never have gotten into it without such an introduction. We were able to enjoy all sorts of privileges as honored guests. He pours his love out into our hearts and sends us hope with his Holy Spirit to guide and inspire us and to fill us with the joy of his permanent presence. The fourth gift is looking to share in God's glory. The very mention of an escort into his presence reminds us of our heavenly destiny.